Today we're going to be covering the most interesting part of modernity, in my opinion, technology. Technology is a bit of a vague buzzword, but what does it actually mean? The word comes from the Greek techne, meaning skills, arts and crafts, but now it is an abstraction for anything mechanical or any tool. This video will analyse the early philosophy of technology and in doing so hopefully come up with a more comprehensive definition of technology and a complete philosophical worldview of technology. It is around the 18th century that philosophers, unsurprisingly German, start reflecting about technology in a part of philosophy called metaphysics. Both leaders of industrial and philosophical innovation, the Germans were bound to mix these fields at some point. Even if German philosophers were pioneers in this field of philosophy, by the time industrialization had settled in the global stage, the German philosophical tradition had passed its peak, and seldom do we have the complete insights or observations from the German titans of philosophy on the technological phenomenon. However, more technically oriented philosophers did emerge, including Marx, Hegel, Nietzsche, Ernest Kapp, Eberhardt, Zimmer, Friedrich Dessauer, Friedrich Junger, and Heidegger. These are obviously are not the most wholly technical philosophers, but all have made very useful examinations. Today, the focus of this video will be on the most complete metaphysics and forward-thinking assessments from namely three philosophers, Dessauer, Junger, and Heidegger. I will explain a brief, small part of their relevant ideas and observations on technological development and use their ideas to examine technology today. Before we jump in, let me quickly go over a couple of things. My research is based on a book entitled Metaphysics of Technology by Skirbina. Skirbina is looking to create a pantechniconic thesis. This is a metaphysical cosmic theory of technology. Consequentially, I'll try to do the same while bringing in other thinkers' ideas to build on the metaphysics. What is metaphysics, I hear you ask? Metaphysics is a philosophical language to examine the true forces that drive our world. It links together many aspects of material objects or ideas to come up with their essences. The essence is simply a description of the true meaning and tendency of things. For instance, a simply material worldview would see a gun as the sum of its parts. A metaphysical analysis looks at what makes a gun, a gun. This would be the ability to shoot. Then one may examine all weapons' common features and come up with their essences. For example, the ability to kill. Now that we've established these facts, let's get on with the meat of the matter. Let's begin with Heidegger's metaphysical analysis, unfortunately the most complex part of this video. Heidegger, little known outside of Germany during his lifetime, shot to philosophical stardom in the 80s and now takes his place among the 20th century pantheon of intellectual giants. Famous for his disdain of capitalism and Marxism alike, his work on being and for single-handedly popularizing the philosophy of technology. So why does Heidegger use metaphysics to describe technology? Heidegger suggests that our deep immersion in the technical world and its thinking stops us from looking objectively at it. In addition, we do not acknowledge that technology has moved from simple hand tools to massive global industrial processes. For example, we describe technology as a tool, while our every waking moment is dictated and driven by technology. For Heidegger, a simple tool cannot form such a massive industrial system. He theorizes that there must be deeper forces at play. Furthermore, the fact that we have created the word technology to describe all tools suggests in conventional metaphysics that they must have an essence to bind them together. Heidegger suggests that we should carry out a metaphysical analysis of the technological phenomenon to understand what's really going on. If we do not, we are totally vulnerable to be manipulated by technology. Heidegger's approach to metaphysics of technology is to analyse the act of creation and to fit technology within this framework. Heidegger explains that we need new terminology to describe technology. It is best to look at Heidegger's metaphysics through his new terminology and I'll go through them one by one. The seven terms we will cover are revealing, ordering, bringing forth, essence, in framing, standing reserve and watchfulness. It is best to note that Heidegger takes a very fluid approach to the world. These terms are not rigid categories or definitions. They intertwine and overlap. Categorizing them simply helps us understand the essence of technology. We shall start with revealing. This is sometimes translated from the original German to be presencing. Revealing is the process by which things come into being, how things are created. Revealing has two forms. These are firstly bringing forth which is the process of making, 
And secondly, we have ordering, which is the restructuring of things. I will simplify this for the layman. Creation is carried out in two ways, bringing forth and ordering. Now let's look at the first form of revealing, bringing forth. Heidegger outlines what is created and bringing forth. These are simple technology, art and nature. The first two, if we look back to our Greek definition of technology, are techne, meaning they are arts and crafts of human construction. Obviously, nature is neither an art nor a craft, nor human construction, so it's not techne. Heidegger suggests that bringing forth to humans is a relatively benign and unthreatening form of revealing. Next, we move to the second term of revealing, ordering, the process of restructuring. He describes ordering as, quote, the aggressive wrestling of an unruly nature to a systematic mould. One may view ordering as a second order of revealing. It takes what has been produced by bringing forth, nature, art, simple technology, and forms and moulds them to a new structure. We then move to the essence of technology, which is in framing. In framing is a systematic categorization and reshaping of things. As you can see, in framing is simply a form of ordering. It is the way technology carries out ordering. This means technology is a new way for the cosmic force of ordering to act in our world. He sees, in the modern world, the only technology that embodies in framing is modern technology. But how can in framing be the essence of technology if only modern technology carries out in framing, you may ask? A valid question, dear viewer. But Heidegger explains the essence of in framing has always been present in technology, but up until the modern age, this essence has been hidden. It is therefore only during the Industrial Revolution in framing has revealed itself to the world. Therefore, Heidegger suggests that after industrialization, technology began to act out its essence of inframing. This is a strange suggestion, in my opinion. Why must the specific moment of industrialization in the grand scale of technological development suddenly bring about this forceful nature of technology? Instead, I propose inframing was always carried out by technology, insignificant at first, only noticeable by the keenest eyes, and as technology progressed, the more it could inframe. Then came Industrial Revolution, which ramped up the intensity and scale of technology to such a degree that it suddenly had the ability to inframe all aspects of life on every corner of the globe. It seemed as if inframing popped out of industrialization, but in reality we could only notice inframing until it had a significant presence. Heidegger explains technical progress occurs in small incremental steps. It presents gifts to us, new medicines, new tools, new luxuries. We are enticed by these seemingly benevolent gifts. However, very slowly, the technological system's means to inframe grows and grows. Suddenly, we realize its true nature. However, it is too late, and the world is already totally dominated by technology. We then move to our second last term, standing reserve. Standing reserve is the energy, material, and people that is at the techno-industrial system's disposal to use. Technology is a manipulator of energy, like a lift needs a gravitational energy in a counterweight and a phone needs electricity, the techno-industrial system's energy needs increases as it expands. To Heidegger, the space technology encompasses must be turned into a standing reserve, a potential energy pool. It logically follows the more complex and expansive our technological systems, the more the world it must convert into this standing reserve. Now, I shall explain what I think Heidegger means by this. In consequence, we see the world only through the lens of material usefulness. Our modes of revealing truth, i.e. science, become solely focused on what is valuable. What is valuable is in relation to their power, or as Nietzsche would put it, how well they serve the will to power. This has only been allowed to happen in modernity because Western metaphysics has reduced the ungraspable spring of being and reality to a static presence which can then be represented as a concept. These concepts are then dealt with in terms of simple relation and calculation. Therefore, we have mistaken this representation of reality and its reasoning as thought, where thought is in fact much more than this single representation. Such a worldview of false objectivity is in opposition to man that exists in the subjective relation to the world. 
This to me sounds suspiciously like the ideas encapsulated in this quote by traditionist conservative thinker Nicolas Gomez Davila. Modern man denies himself every metaphysical dimension and considers himself a mere object of science, but he screams when they exterminate him as such. End quote. This means if man continues along this path of philosophical objective development, he will not survive in his current form. Of course, this depends to what extent man can deny himself scientific and technological ways of thinking. José Ortega y Gasset, a technological philosopher, had this to say on the subject. Man begins where technology begins, whereby the mission of technology consists in releasing man for the task of being himself. End quote. In modernity, we praise those innovators who deal with the world that has been interpreted as merely material in the most effective fashion. People like Elon Musk because he has made great advancement towards getting man on Mars. When he achieves this goal, he has done it. But done what? This Herculean effort has only granted him the possibility of wanting more. It is a hollow achievement. Oswald Spengler, in his magnum opus, Decline of the West, describes Western civilization as Faustian. Just as Faust sold his soul to the devil to gain greater power, Western man, to attain great power and understanding, sold his soul to technology. However, ironically, he will never attain enough power or any real understanding. This is not good or bad according to Spengler, only how it is. Such a civilization was bound to occur as the will to power is present in all men. In summary, Heidegger views technological development as a force that will order humans and their world to a greater and greater extent, treating everyone as mere tools in a standing reserve while removing the mystery and beauty of the world as it uncovers and categorizes all its secrets. What Heidegger especially stresses is that technology is not a morally neutral tool. Not only does everything contain an essence and ends, but it is preposterous to claim that a system as gigantic and interconnected as the global technological complex simply arose randomly without any essence of technology. Simply, to deny the sheer gargantuan and growing impact of technology on everything is lunacy. If we see it as such, we have already lost our battle for our sovereignty. A grim conclusion. But how does Heidegger suggest we approach technology? He suggests that technology is both a danger and a source to enlightenment. The modern world has very sophisticated ways of gaining knowledge through science and philosophy. We must use these resources at our disposal to examine the growth and nature of technology. We must watch over it, understand its essence to learn what to do and not become overwhelmed by its might. Heidegger is quite vague in this conclusion. Those who realise the gravity of the technological question are meant to be watchful. But what then? He offers little clarity, that somehow we will coexist with it. Heidegger is clearly paralysed by the technological phenomenon. Such is the case that he remarks, Only a god can save us now. But where did Heidegger get these ideas from? A philosopher called Dessauer outlined in a less thorough manner all of Heidegger's ideas 70 years beforehand in 1881. Dessau, in his most famous work, Philosophies der Technik, outlines the need for a new language to tackle technology, the principle of watchfulness, and is the first to take a metaphysical approach to the subject. Due to Heidegger's more complete approach, I will not fully cover Dessauer. However, I will try and explain only some of Dessauer's ideas that expand and contradict Heidegger. His positions I will cover are threefold, on invention, on science, and on progress. Let's begin with invention. Dessauer, like Heidegger, suggests that the essence of technology can be found in how it acts in our world. However, while Heidegger analyzes the cosmic functions of creation and fits technology within one of these creation systems, Dessauer approaches this from the human scale of invention. So, how does Dessauer analyze invention? He describes invention as envisioning the pre-existing, and explains it as follows. The inventor intellectually seeks a solution to a problem. For each problem, there is an ideal perfect solution. Consequentially, the inventor attempts to envision this solution. The more he investigates the problem, the form of the solution becomes clearer to him. However, the limitations of the human mind mean the inventor can only grasp a vague form of this ideal, and must go through a series of different interactions before coming to an optimum form. One can view this process of invention 
like how a painter will exclaim he has envisioned his piece of art. This optimum form, this perfect ideal solution, is non-physical. It's an idea. As something non-physical, it must exist in a metaphysical realm. Dasar explains this realm must be the fourth realm, or Vierte Reich in German, adding to the three other realms, nature, morality and aesthetics, which we find in Kant's metaphysics. So, what does this all mean? Inventing is a means to directly view being, to glimpse the platonic form of a solution and materially manifest the ideal. Therefore, the act of inventing is to observe the essence of invention. Fundamentally, a new technology is the perfect solution to a specific problem. Now, this has some implications. Practically, inventions tend towards perfect forms of themselves. Technology must become better and better. For example, a new technology must be more efficient. This is because an invention will always be more efficient at a task than not using said invention. Otherwise, it is not a solution. It is just useless. Therefore, technological development tends towards not only total efficiency, but the perfection of itself. This means technological systems must destroy anything that gets in the way of carrying out its function of greater efficiency. This means, eventually, any efficiencies must be ironed out of technological systems. So what inefficiencies exist in our technological systems that will be ironed out? We can see intuitionally, wild nature, resource limitations, and humans to name a few. Yes, you heard me correctly humans. Think of all the inefficiencies we pose. We need leisure, distractions, and half our days are for sleep. The technological system over the years has already reduced our inefficiencies significantly. We have been moved to large city complexes to reduce travel times. We drink coffee to be able to work harder and longer. Those who disrupt societies are either given medication to become more docile or imprisoned. The extent of how technological systems can fix our inefficiencies depends on how advanced it is. It therefore logically follows that it will continue to alter human behavior, psychology and physiology to a greater and greater extent the more developed the system gets. Eventually, the system will produce permanent cures to our inefficiencies in the form of technological upgrades and genetic engineering. Under immense pressure to take the next step in human evolution, for the sake of so-called progress, many will be slowly altered. Eventually, humans will become completely unrecognizable. As a disclaimer, this analysis is an extension of Ellul's and Kaczynski's theory on technology. Dassau does not make this link. However, I believe it's worth mentioning as Dassau has created a metaphysical basis to these ideas through his ideas of invention. Now let's move to Dessauer on science. Like the previous section on invention, I'll bring in other ideas to expand on Dessauer. Dessauer, during his lifetime in the 19th century, observed the synthesis of science and technology. To develop technology and for humans to carry out more complex tasks, we must understand the world in a more and more thorough fashion. From simple intuition to make hand axes, to the scientific method to produce industrial complexes. Therefore, for technology to complete, more and more complex actions, it must be able to understand and categorize the world to greater and greater extents. As the astute among you may have noticed, the ordering and categorization of the world is in framing. What I have outlined here is a pragmatic explanation for firstly, why technology's essence is in framing. It must order and categorize to act. Secondly, why technology must in frame to carry out more and more complex functions meaning to develop and improve itself. This is intuitionally sound, as for example, the more intelligent an organism is, the more complex functions it can carry out. From plants that can sense light to move towards it, to fish interpreting light to distinguish between food and predators, and finally, large brains in primates allowing them to socialize. The big brain people among my audience may raise the question, why does nature not embody in framing? Heidegger, as we've already mentioned, suggests that nature is not techne. However, I disagree with this proposition. This distinction is arbitrary. Nature embodies in framing. It categorizes, it understands, and it reacts. Stripping both technology and nature to their bare essences, they're exactly the same. I make the case that nature is techne. Nature is simply a non-man-made technology, while technology is man-made techne. 
Now, let's glance back on Heidegger's ideas on bringing forth and ordering. Bringing forth creates the world, and ordering restructures it. Both nature and technology have the essence of inframing, which must order that is produced by bringing forth, namely matter. So what does this mean? One can view the universe as levels of complexity, each level ordering the level below it. For example, a planet is created. Nature orders the planet's resources, creating new complexities in the form of life. This life restructures the natural world in such a way that technology is created, which orders the levels below it. In this model, we in the 21st century are currently at the stage where technology is in the process of becoming its own independent level above nature, allowing it to order nature and the material below it. Now let's move on to Dessau's comments on progress. Technological development to Dessauer is teleological. We do not control the progression of technology. It is an illusion that technological progression is a choice totally controlled by humans. We are in fact dictated its development. There is a set path of development humans must take and will take. This is because, if you may recall, inventions are perfect solutions while humans have a set number of base problems. To Dessauer, in an alternate universe, the only difference between the technology from our universe and theirs would be purely aesthetic. This seems strange to us, who develop technology, but one must ask oneself, can we turn back technological development? Can we unlearn its knowledge? Can modern society go against the trend of the last 10,000 years? This task would require either a setback so significant that progression is materially impossible, or a never-ending policing of people to stop intellectual inquiry, and to go against the curious nature of humans is to deny a fundamental quality of man. I admit this is an extremely complex question, to what extent are we in control, that Dessau does not properly address, and hopefully I will maybe touch it in a future video. Anyway, we can conclude for Dessau, technological development is a force of nature, intimately linked to the human essence. If this is so, we cannot escape our technological destiny. What this destiny is? Technology's essence will reveal it to us, whether we discover it or it is set upon us by the march of so-called progress. Lastly, Dessau states everything in the world is interlinked. Technology must change everything, man, society, nature. Nothing can remain untouched. The sheer might of technology might seem daunting and even frightening, but Dessau reassures us technology is nothing but good. Technology is a window to being, i.e. the ideal, and therefore to the divine. Not only can it not be stopped, but it will allow us to eventually gain true knowledge of the forms. This is technologically deterministic positions, where the gifts technology bestows upon us outweighs its negatives. I suspect Dessau's theological background and his Catholic faith has heavily impacted this conclusion, as technology's essence is part of the theological fabric of reality created by a loving God, technology cannot have negative ends and is a part of God's plan for reality. However, take this conclusion with a pinch of salt, as I am not well read on Catholic doctrines on progress, and I know some theologians who have written about technology would disagree with Dessau's conclusions. Moving on from Dessau, we jump back to the 20th century with Friedrich Jünger, not to be confused with his more famous brother, Ernest Jünger. Both World War I servicemen who disdained the Nazi regime, modernity and materialism equally. What separated Friedrich Jünger from his brother is he focused much of his work on ecology and technology. It's worth noting, unlike Dessauer, Jünger is very sceptical about technology's promise. For Jünger, technology is a system of actions and processes. Technology is heading towards the perfection, the realisation of itself in a new form of life through the ultimate displacement of the organic. The organic creates technology on which it coalesces and increases in intensity until it totally displaces it. Jünger suggests that technology arose from a benign need to lighten our burdens. We eventually get used to our tools and forget how to do things. Humans become dependent on the tool, which is now a keystone of the functioning society. Over time, our dependency on technology increases, so does its autonomy to impose its will upon us. Technology increasingly resides in societies and urban jungles of its own creation, and is increasingly able to express its own essence, now unrestrained by nature and human dependency. It is only in such spaces that we see the truly coercive force of technology. 
Humans must maintain technological society. We must adapt to its unintended consequences, and we must find solutions to problems caused by technology. We're the only solution we can afford to take. More technology, lest the system we depend on collapse. Jünger suggests technological development must evolve into its displacing form by necessity. As the more advanced technology is, the more it must consume, more material, more land and more organisms, and we must let it do so. Such excessive consumption must only get worse as technology develops. As technology progresses, the more complex technology must become. Complex machines, to be useful, must carry out their functions faster, better, or at a bigger scale than previous methods, using successfully more energy and more material. For example, a car needs a massive production network, while sourcing materials and components need their own infrastructure complexes. In comparison, a bike needs a much smaller production network. Some of you may raise the question, but how come some technologies like modern computers consume less material and energy than, say, a computer from the 1970s? I could answer this by using Dessau's thesis of invention, explaining that an old computer is part of the development cycle to the optimum form of a computer. However, it is much easier to answer this question pragmatically. Look at the world around you. The global techno-industrial system has expanded massively, touching every corner of the world compared to the industrial system of the 1700s, undoubtedly using more energy and more material. Consequentially, Jünger makes a startling prediction seldom seem at the time at such depth. Ecological disasters. It naturally follows that the never-ending plunder of our natural world and its displacement will sow the seeds for ecological collapse. This is remarkable, as very few at the time were investigating ecological issues, and also because still now, the ecological movement pins the blame on capitalism, greed, consumer societies and overpopulation, and a myriad of other culprits. In order for these systems to exploit nature, something, namely technology, must facilitate these systems. It is no surprise that the severity of the exploitation of nature has increased in tandem with technological development. Today, the majority of climate activism revolves around reducing carbon emissions, banning fossil fuels, and renewable energy. While ironically, such protesters live in urban spaces that have superseded nature and live off incredibly high material and energy using lifestyles. What climate activists should glean from Jünger is that carbon emissions are a fraction of the problem. Climate change is part of a long chain of ecological disasters that will continue to emerge long after climate change has occurred. The only difference is now these disasters are a global phenomenon. For the next section, I'll read a passage on Jünger from the Metaphysics of Technology. It may seem strange that this titanic modern industrial system, with its human organisation that tries to engulf everything, and whose power we encounter at every step, should have grown from seemingly unconnected trials and errors, from widely scattered inventions, from decidedly humble beginnings. But the convergence of these inventions is only an expression of the convergence of a way of thinking, which is absolutely uniform, no matter its point of origin. Wherever this thought goes to work, its very manifestation contributes to the mechanical arts all over the world. What Jünger is explaining here is our immersion in technology is the first step to man becoming increasingly technical himself. This renders us only able to observe the technical phenomenon within its own prism of thinking, promoting unshakable faith in its development. The extent of technical domination is striking. Science becomes a servant to technology. Education is a training centre for savants of technical progress. And any force that would deny technical progress resources is attacked. However, for Jünger, humans are completely unadapted for a technical lifestyle. In consequence, our philosophy, politics and sociology are geared towards constantly trying to shape society that humans are somewhat adapted to. A noble yet futile cause, due to the ever-changing and therefore unstable nature of a technological society. Jünger points out what I've explained above shows two essential qualities of technology. Automatism and all-embracing universalism. Behind automatism is technology's desire to become independent, out of our control, and a new order of life, while all-embracing universalism is the need for technologies to spread and consume more, while technology's expression is functionally the same wherever it manifests. 
These two essences create the perfection of technology, the complete mechanization of the world. So what does Jünger think we should do about the phenomenon? He rejects the notion of a revolution against technology, or a retrograde back to the land social movement. As he expresses clearly, nothing is further from my mind than the romantic rejection of technology. He instead suggests, like Dessauer and Heidegger, people should be watchful over technology. To all men who see themselves as more than means to technical ends. He hopes a significant proportion of the population becomes aware of the technical problem. Once again, this conclusion is intentionally vague. If we take what these philosophers have said at face value, we come to quite a pessimistic conclusion. Technological progress is unstoppable, and the future is likely bleak. However, such pessimistic defeatism is not needed, as when man is backed up against the wall, he can either choose to give in or face the inevitable with courage. Optimism is cowardice. And there we are, folks. That was our whistle-stop tour of my recent reading. Well, not so recent now, actually. This took me forever, and it was my first attempt to rise and upload philosophy to YouTube, so sorry for the possible errors and poor style. Anyway, uh, smash like and uh, subscribe!